Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, it's just after Christmas, and usually we're talking about this team finally starting to win some games and finishing their early season losing streak, but it's our off-season show. Matt, what a weird season as we've talked about. I'm Dan alongside Matt, and we're getting ready to start the NHL season. Yeah, it, you know, we're, we've both been in isolation and with nothing to do for months, and it's like, come on, hockey, get back so we have something to do. So the we won't get into all the divisions, but as we know, the divisions have been changed up and the Flames are playing in the North Division, brought to you by Scotiabank. I don't know why they didn't just call it the Canadian Division, um, but I find it interesting that we're seeing sponsorships at the division level for the first time in the league. Yeah, uh, and you know that between that and the helmets, that that's just going to remain indefinitely. I don't see that ever going away. Do all the teams have helmet uh, ads or just a few of them? Uh, a good portion. I think all of them are going to. They might not have sold. You know. I think the, NH- no, I mean, I think you... the NHL has already vetoed waste management on the Oilers' helmets, but, you know, it, it, you, it was uh, fitting. If you look at it, would be, for sure. But I don't know if that waste has been managed or not. So True. Maybe 1-800-GOT-JUNK. <laughs> um. I, I, if you look at the NHL, they have like ads now that are changed on TV, and even if you're in the dome, you see them changing out ads. So how long until the helmet ad changes every period? The trainers have to have a first period, second period, and third period helmet for each guy. Yeah. Or Easy remote it's sticker. the Calgary Flames power play brought to you by Macklin Ford, and they're wearing their Macklin Ford helmet on the power play only. <laughs> oh, God. That- we can just have a green dot on there, and they can, you know, digitally impose whatever whatever they need to yeah uh the waves of the future (laughs) that's right well with that let's uh let's take a look at the season that is for the flames and we started talking about it the nhl is going to look very different this year there's some things we still don't know um but the things we do know the flames will be playing an all canadian division they'll be playing only 56 games between uh their first game which starts on January the what's Thursday's day January the 14th and their last game which is later in the year than usual which will run right into March on like or right into May sorry May 8th is our last game 56 games in that time all Canadian teams we're not touching the U.S. at all so we'll be playing against the other six Canadian teams Uh, it's weird and I was saying this to Matt before we got started we don't have the Western and Eastern teams anymore. We're just all playing for the same four playoff spots of those seven. Four will make it, three will not. So it's going to be a very different year for the team and much more of a baseball-like schedule. I mean, as everybody probably knows now, we're playing series against teams. So you look, I think February is probably the best look at this if you're looking at the schedule. But February 1st, 2nd, and 4th, we're in Winnipeg. Then we come back here and we play Edmonton and Winnipeg here. Then three games in Vancouver. Um, so you're going to see a lot more of the same team over and over, which has pros and it has cons. Um, it, it's going to be very different. But Matt, in terms of just the season and the structure, what are your thoughts? Do you think this could help the Flames or do you think this could hinder the Flames? Well, in terms of making the postseason, the Flames act, and the entire North Division have the easiest path to the postseason just due to one fewer team to compete against. That being said... Uh, I know that animosities are going to quickly dial up, and I know that uh, Chantel Kutchuk is uh, probably lamenting the fact that Brady is now in the same division as Matthew. (laughs) You know. (laughs) Yeah, probably Dad, too. Keith won't be too happy. He's going to have to, when he gives his pregame talk to the boys, what's he going to say on all those games? Go punch somebody else. (laughs) Be nice to your brother. Yep. (laughs) You wonder who's going to get time out. You weren't nice to your brother. I want you to sit in the dressing room on your own for 15 minutes. Yeah. Don't talk to anybody. No electronic devices. Yep. I mean, it's not like you can ground them. They're already going to be in isolation when they're not playing their games. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but well, it, hey, it will be interesting. Reverse uh, isolation. Go outside. <laughs> Go outside with your mask and walk around in shame. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think I think it's going to be hard for these teams because if you're not having a good night against a team and you have to see them again the next night or two nights later, I think that's going to be hard sometimes mentally. If a team beats you 8-1 to one and you got to see them again the next night, I think there's going to be some mental gymnastics that these players aren't going to be used to. Yeah, and especially 
like when the you're playing the same team two, three, four times in a row, like it, it just going to be like a playoff series, and you're going to probably see a lot more chippiness throughout the regular season than you normally would. Yeah, and on that too, I think we'll see a lot more stories build. Like even Calgary Winnipeg, which has generally never been much of a series. Look at the playoffs against those teams and some of the stories that we, you know, that we saw develop and the players who had some animosity against each other and and those sort of things. And I think you're going to see that grow when you're playing like you said, two, three, four games against the same guys. Um, and then it'll, you know, fester and move over to the next series when you play them. Because, I mean, we pretty much see everybody every month. There's really not much a month you don't see everybody. So I think you're going to see stories like that develop, which will be which will make it interesting. Yeah. The one thing I do think you'll have to see a lot more of is bench strength. I think from goalies right down to forwards, you're going to see a lot more teams use a lot more guys this year. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that, um, like, especially as the – the season draws down like it, you look at the end of the season like it, if the flames are battling with montreal for a playoff spot or positioning uh, like they face each other five times out of the last 12 games and like it you know like those games like especially if it, those games are important where unless montreal's way out of it or the flames are way in it type of thing that that's going to those games are going to be hugely intense and like that's just not a thing that would have happened previously you know and i think this year every game is going to mean more i mean there's 56 games four of the teams in our division make the playoffs three don't even if you're playing against a team you don't think is going to be in the playoffs i think you know let's say let's say that we're taking on whoever you think the worst team in the in the division is going to be let's just throw out vancouver um, you know, and you're playing against them three times, I think there's going to be much more pressure to win those three and put a good six points up on the trip because you're going to need that cushion. Oh, for sure. And I think that you're going to see more of a playoff-ish intensity, especially with the fact that like we're playing Edmonton and Vancouver ten times and everybody else nine times. Like you're, it, Just the repetition of that, you're going to be having a lot more intensity with everybody. Yeah. And, and I think you'll see a lot more familiarity too. I think as we get into, you know, March, April, May, you're going to start to get to know the goalie tendencies and that sort of thing, which is something you don't often get in Ottawa when you're seeing them once a year. Oh, for sure. And, you know, seeing guys like Carey Price and the Leafs, like it's all just, you know, all of those teams we see one or two times a year and while those games TJ are Brody could have probably kept his house in Calgary. He'll be here enough. Yeah. <laughs> I want um, it to get away. <laughs> he, he, he can isolate himself in his house in Calgary. <laughs> anyway, let, let's take a look at the lineup. We've had some significant changes to the lineup since last year. Uh, we talked about some of them over the offseason and some of the changes that were made. But let's look at the lineup and the roster and how things shake down. Let's start at the back end. And I think probably the biggest change to the lineup this year, Jacob Markstrom brought in. He's going to be wearing number 25. He apparently got permission from Joe Newendike to do so, which I think it's great that he asked for that permission. Um, Newendike may be forever aflame, but 25 is not retired, remember. And his backup right now, David Riddick. And we have two other goaltenders with NHL experience. Louis Domingue, who's currently on waivers, and Garrett Sparks, who's been sent to the AHL. Um, Matt, with, I guess, a couple questions that come to my mind here is how a 56-game season, your starter should be able to play 56 games, but you're not going to want your starter playing 56 games this year. So how many games do you think David Riddick plays as the backup? What do you think that split's going to look like? I think it's going to be somewhat like 35 15 with you know plus or minus of the remaining six games okay and the other thing i mean you know we've had a lot of discussion about david riddick in the past um and if he's an nhl starter and if he's not and i think one thing we have to remember with this guy is he's been around the league for only four years he's played 115 total games I don't think we've had a season yet where he's been given the starter reins that he hasn't been hurt. I mean, last year he was hurt, the year before he was hurt. Um, how many, I guess, as the backup, do you think we're going to be able to rely on him to be our 
full time. I don't even want to call her one B because I think he will be the backup this year. But do you think we'll be relying on Riddick to play the bulk of the games that Markstrom's not, or do you think we're going to have to look to third string Domingue or somebody else to take those reins? Well, it it frankly is up to uh, Riddick and how he plays. Like it, if he wants to continue being an NHL goaltender he has to show that he can actually play at the NHL level consistently. And when he's hot, he's a very good goaltender and a decent starter. But when he's struggling, he's not very good. And he needs to get that consistency and needs to, like, when he does get the opportunities to play, to actually be able to show up and play a good game each time, and or at least most of the time, and, you know, make it so that way you can look at Markstrom as you're going down the stretch and maybe give him an extra game here and there off to Riddick, and, you know, like, it, it, ideally, I'd like to see Riddick play 22, 23, 24 games just to keep marks from fresh especially heading into the postseason but you know that's entirely on the level of play that you're getting from riddick if riddick's not able to do it like we've seen in the past the flames sort of go to goaltenders when they shouldn't because they had no options i think that's probably a fair thing to say do you think that if the flames aren't seeing what they want from riddick they have to keep going back to him or are you comfortable if Louis Domingue or Garrett Sparks or Zagadulin or somebody where to get some starts in there. Uh, honestly, if Riddick isn't doing the job, then it, you might as well try out other people. Like it, that's what they're there for. And you know, if Riddick is playing like Eddie Lack <laughs> when he played here, then you know you can go in a different direction. And if the other guys play serviceable minutes, then hey, awesome. You have a job for a while. David Riddick's in a contract year. He's making $2.75 million. I don't think the Flames can re-sign him next year for anything close to that, seeing that they've got Markstrom at six. And I think you might see a more motivated David Riddick this year because it's probably a... I, I hate to say this about the guy, but this is probably the most he's ever going to make as an NHL goaltender. And and I think that he's playing for a job, and he's playing to show that he's, a, a like you said, an NHL goalie. I don't know if he's a starter or if he's a 1B or if he's a backup, but um, I think really he's going to be playing for a job this year. And whether it's in Calgary or elsewhere, remember there's going to be two brand new goalie jobs next year. I, I think that this is probably Riddick's year to shine. Yeah, and he's playing himself into a job for next season, regardless of it's yeah. in Calgary or otherwise. and Or conversely, playing himself out of a job. Um, I honestly, I think, he's, I, I think he's good enough. Somebody will take a swing at him. It's just a matter of where you where you are in their depth chart. Yeah, like honestly, I don't see the Flames bringing Riddick back one way or the other, just due to finances. Because uh, I think that cheaper options, like if Markstrom's your guy and your starter, then he better be at six million for six years. Yeah, then you know, like you're you're gonna want to have. A guy like a Zagadulin or, you know, insert prospect guy here or young, cheapish goalie, whomever, you know, like, it, you know, if, yeah. if Ritter has a good year, I think the Flames will offer him a deal, but they will say, this is the number, take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. You know, like, let's just say, let's make up a number. Let's say they were willing to pay that back up 1.5 and they were going to go out shopping. We know that with a lot of GMs, it's the idea of the, the devil, you know, versus the devil, you don't. Right, And I think that they might say to Ritter, hey, if you want to stay, 1.5 is what we got for the position. Take it or leave it. And I could also see Riddick going to the free agent market, not getting the deal he wants, and then re-signing. Yep, definitely. Um, and that's – I guess the reason I bring Riddick up is to me he's just – he never – the Flames looked at this guy as the next – great goalie for this organization he's never really turned into that he's been you know he's flashed with it like you yeah, said flashes but you're not seeing you're not seeing the consistency yeah. you need and we've had to have other goalies i mean arguably we had talbot here to to back riddick up who i think became the better goalie of the two so you're seeing riddick losing his job to other guys and i think this is his year to show is he a starter or is he a backup and i think there's room for him in this league as a backup yeah Oh yeah, like there's uh, he's better than quite a number of goalies. It's just 
if he can find some consistency, he could be a really good goaltender. It's just, can you find that consistency? And that's been his problem right from the get-go. While we're talking about goalies, I mean, obviously the Flames spent a lot of money on Jacob Markstrom. He's a 30-year-old goalie. They have him for six more years of $6 million. Um, I think we're all expecting Markstrom to have a great year, but do you think that Markstrom might almost be looked at by fans as not being enough? He's really the first time we've had a solid goalie since Kippersoff, and if the Flames aren't getting deep in the playoffs, do you think a lot of people are going to be disappointed by Markstrom? Well, And there's maybe false expectations on him. Well, yes and no. Um, Calgary's always hard on their goalies, regardless, unless it's somebody who, you know, like Kipper found his footing here. Um, if the Flames struggle or miss the playoffs or lose out early, then, yeah, there's going to be criticism, even if it's not warranted. But, you know, you have... Re- Markstrom is one of the best goalies in the NHL. There's probably three or four goalies that are in his tier right at the top and you know if he plays at that level like you look at the flames the last two seasons like they got below average goaltending each of the last two seasons and yet we're still right near the top of the league two years ago and we're a decent team last year so if they get elite goaltending well like that does change the expectations for this team and you know, if they don't meet those expectations, then of course the team's going to have a lot more question marks. I was talking to a friend of mine about Markstrom, and this is where I got this sort of idea from, and he was saying, you know, Kipper used to be able to steal games for this team that they shouldn't have won, and I said, yeah, but the Calgary Flames were a very different team back when Kipper was our goalie, and we were really a group of, I mean, you look at the 4 Cup run, we were a group of spare parts nobody else wanted, right? We were sort of the toys nobody else wanted, like in uh, in Toy Story, and I think this team, like you said, has done well without good goaltending, so I think you're not looking for Markstrom to steal games. You're not looking for Markstrom to bail out a bad team. You're just looking for him to give us what we didn't have sometimes, which was, you know, solid goaltending that defensemen can trust. Yeah, like, frankly, the Flames, in terms of, like, the overall team, have been one of the elite teams the last two seasons, and that's with just adequate goaltending. So, you know, it, with the forward and defense group being of that caliber, it, it takes a lot of pressure off of the goaltender. It's sort of like Vasilevsky in Tampa Bay. Like, Vasilevsky is a good goaltender in and of himself, but then, you know, he also has the Tampa Bay Lightning in front of him. So that Yeah, makes... and I don't think Markstrom has to be an elite goalie no. here. I mean, you know, I think if we get another one more really good season out of him, which I think is possible, I think we can get, you know, Markstrom at 70% is still, what you know, good enough for this team. Yeah. And, you know, according to, like, the metrics and all that, like, his style of play fits more with the Flames style of play. So hopefully that does translate you know, into success, but we'll see. And, you know, like, there's a lot of moving parts. Like, the whole Flames defense core is different now. Um, similar pieces in those spots, but just different parts. Um, well, let's move up there. And before I do, I just want to look at the breakdown of money for each of our positions. So of our $82 million salary cap, we're spending $8.75 million on goalies. And again, probably a little high as we talked about, but I don't think next year's backup, whoever that is, makes anywhere near two two and three quarters. Mm-hmm. Well, you were mentioning the defensive uh, group, Matt, and let's take a look at that group then, unless there's anything else no. about the goalies you want to say. No, just uh, looking forward to seeing how Marks from Fairs. Uh, it's... Oh, like I'm a huge goalie fan, so you know it's the part of this off season that I've been looking forward to the most, and just have to wait for the games to get underway to see how it goes. It's going to be weird to see a goalie wearing 25. Yeah. But well, it, it, uh... you know, if you're an Ed Belfour fan, you're used to it, so weird numbers. The other thing is I saw a picture of Markstrom's new gear and it's very plain. Like I know that we've been going plainer and plainer with gear, but he's pretty much just got solid white pads this year. Yeah. I love it. You know, it, it fits with the retro theme. 
entirely. The Flames are going with a retro jersey. Go with, like, the plainest equipment possible. Makes entire sense. You know, I was kind of hoping that I know they're from different eras, but I was kind of hoping if we were going with the retro gear, we'd go with retro goalie pads and someone would take inspiration from Trevor Kidd. Those are still my favorite Flames goalie pads. True. Um, you know, they're, they're just, yeah, the, the ones with the, you know, the ones I'm talking about, yeah. with the, the red ones with the yellow flames. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I just, I always find that white pads and I think it was, what was it? It was either Elliot or, uh, Talbot who had different home and away pads. Like I think go red at home. I just think that white looks weird at home. Mm-hmm. At least we've got the white C now to balance it out. But anyway, we'll, we'll talk goalie pads another day. Yep. <laughs> um, Let's move up to the defense. And if you look at the defense as it sits right now, three familiar faces, three new faces. Mark Giordano, Rasmus Anderson, Noah Hannafin, Chris Tanev, Yusuf Valimaki, and Nikita Nesterov are the six guys they've been playing at practice together. Um, let's let's start with that bottom pair. So you've got Valimaki, Nesterov. And, and Valimaki is an interesting prospect. I think we've all been waiting to see him. We've seen some of them at the NHL level. But do you think the best bet is to bring... Valimaki up and start him playing third pair minutes or send him to Stockton and let him play first pair minutes. He looked great playing against men overseas this year. I'm almost thinking I'd rather start him in Stockton and play first pair minutes. Well, um, it's also need and he's a huge guy at six foot five and a very physically talented player. He can throw hits. And I think that the flames frankly are better suited with him in the lineup. And I honestly don't see him being on the third pairing for that long. Uh, like, maybe just this season, I think you're going to start seeing him move up quickly in the ranks. Um, with his play in Finland, like, he was spectacular in Finland. And, like, I, honestly, I could see him finishing the season getting top four minutes. Uh, he's really looked dynamite, and it's very encouraging. He's only 20, so... I think 20 or 21 and he he's really young and I think that he just needs like I he could play first pairing minutes in Stockton but at this point I don't know if there's any much more for him to learn down there I think he needs to be at the elite level and play at that elite level I think that you know, valimaki has got a lot of potential, like you said. And I, for me, the question is, and there's one of these in every organization. There's that one guy who looks hot, but he, he sort of busts because he can never be healthy. And I'm hoping that's not going to be um, valimaki From what we've seen so far, he can't stay healthy. But I'm hoping that after this, he can. Because I'd really hate for him to be that guy who every year is playing five games and then he's out. Yeah. Or ten games and then he's out. Yeah. That would be extremely frustrating, especially because... Like, frankly, looking at the defense core, I think he is the most talented, potential-wise, of the group. And I think if he does meet his potential, will be, like, the next big player on the blue line for the Flames. Who would you pair him up with on that bottom pair this, to start the season? Uh, Nesterov's a perfectly good o- option. I, I liked Nesterov back when he was with Tampa and Montreal. Uh, he had a lot of holes in his game, but the potential was there and he seems to have ironed out a lot of those holes in Russia the last couple seasons. So I don't, I think he's going to be more or less what uh, Gustafson was for the flames, but like a offensively skilled kind of iffy defensive ish, but not terribly inept defensive defenseman. So, you know, yeah, I think Nestorov is as good as anybody to start with, at least. Yeah, and the Flames have plenty of options, like guys like Mackey who and Shillington, uh, who are probably going to start the year in Stockton. Um, you know, they are the two that I think that need the minutes more than anything. Shillington, I think, will probably stay as the number seven, but yeah, I think they need the minutes to get the opportunity and go. So from what I've been reading, and someone can correct us on Twitter or Facebook if I'm wrong, but from what I was reading and what I understand is we can't just call up and down as we usually did. There's a 10-day period where guys have to quarantine to go up and down. So if you want a guy like Shillington up here, you're going to have to wait to bring him up, which might 
sort of reduce who you're bringing up and down because especially a young player they might miss how many games during that quarantine period yeah true you know you can't just pull a guy up for a night or oh let's try him at the NHL level like yeah we want to try him but then he's missing three games while he's quarantined true um, but I, I agree with you about Shillington I think Shillington I think we might have seen better ceiling on when we drafted him and I'm thinking his ceiling right now is probably a number four at best on a on some teams, I think probably five, six in Calgary. Um, but I think he's a guy that just needs to play, and I think he'll start in Stockton for that reason. Mm-hmm. And he he could easily be the number six as well um, instead of Nesterov. I think that it, it, it's one of those situations where I think that Nesterov, I think it's Nesterov's job to lose right now. Yeah, I think you'll see them split more often than not. Like if somebody's coming out of the lineup, it'll be Nesterov for Shillington. And I could even see some flexibility of, like, the Flames perhaps playing seven defensemen in a game or some situation. You know, it just depends, really. And, you know, like, especially if, like, say, the forward injury troubles, I could see more defensemen playing in that style of game and that kind of thing. And I think one guy that might be underrated this year as a number seven or eight for this team is... Uh, Alex Petrovic. And I mean, he's 6'4". He's a right shot, which this team hasn't had a lot of. Um, I think you might see him. I think I would even try him with Valimaki. Uh, I think that the Flames would probably be better uh, for the time being. I think that Petrovic is quite bad defensively. Um, so, like, while he's big, uh, he's bad. <laughs> So I guess it depends what you're looking for. If you're just looking for some big bodies against some teams, or if yeah. you're looking for for him, I think that like he's Stockton bound as like the first pairing, second pairing guy, like veteran leader ish guy. I don't see it. I I would sooner see uh, Stone be back. Um, because that's the guy we're never gonna get rid of. He's like a boomerang. We buy him out, we bring him back. We get rid of him, we bring him into PTO. Like he's almost like the lost puppy dog who just hangs around. Yeah. Well, he he's serviceable. He does a decent. Do you remember job. the guy in the movie Office Space who got fired, but he still came into the office every day? Yeah. It's gonna be Michael Stone. Didn't we get rid of you? No. It's a figment of your imagination. Didn't we trade you, Toronto? Yeah, I just didn't report. Here I am. Yeah. You know, they'll they'll have, like, the old-timers game playing, and he'll just be sitting in the dressing room because he thinks he's supposed to be there. Yep. Or the hitman will be playing, and he'll show up as the extra defenseman. Yep. Um, looking at the, the group of defensemen still around, I think, you know, there's really nobody that is going to probably be on this taxi squad or play that we haven't talked about. Kinnevel won't be. Uh, Carl Johan Lerby needs to go to the AHL. Mackie, maybe. Um, and Yellison is going to the AHL. Yeah, and, like, for the overall composure of the team, uh, like, I think that, uh, you know, like, the Flames lost Brody and Hamannick last year to free agency, and I think that basically you're, the Flames replaced that type of guy with similar. Um, uh, TJ Brody, Rasmus Anderson graduated, I think, into his spot. And uh, Chris Tanev, I think, replaces Hamannick. And I think that Valimaki replaces Anderson. So, like... It- well, let's let's talk about those two guys you mentioned. I don't disagree with you. Yeah, I think you're right. But now we have a, four more defensemen. Tanev, Hannafin, Anderson, Geo. Um, and, and I think you're right. Tanev fills the hole well. Yeah. For what we lost. I, I Honestly, I think that on the totality, I think the Flames got marginally better from that foursome but i think that anderson is a little bit less than brody but tanev's a little better than hamannick so see and and outside of you know one being marginally better and one being a little bit worse i think the flames got more consistent i mean we sure. saw with brody weeks where he'd go and he just looked terrible and then he played two really good games and they look marginal like i think Anderson and Tanev are going to be better, consistent top four forwards for this team. Mm -hmm. One might be a little bit better and one may be a little bit worse, but at least you're going to get that same performance night in, night out. Yeah, I agree. And if you look at top teams, they're not always best with every player, but they're consistent. You know what you're going to get from most of their players. Yeah, exactly. And that inconsistency is always the hard part because you just don't know what you're getting from your team at any given point. And usually that's not a good thing. 
No, for sure. Rasmus Anderson took a big step last year. He's 24. Uh, this is 24-year-old season. He signed a $4.5 million deal. The Flames have been playing him on defense with Mark Giordano in the first pair, and their second pair has been Hannah Fintanev. Are those the way that you'd break those yeah. four guys down, or would you would you change some things? Yeah, definitely. That's exactly the way I would do it, because each of the young guys has a veteran leader with them, and you know while uh, those two guys are established NHLers, they're still very young between Hannah yeah. and Anderson. And they have a lot to learn to take their game to the, that next level. And Giordano is awesome at teaching, and Tanev is pretty well, good. And, and G- Giordano's like the Midas touch. Everybody he's played with has looked better than they should. Yeah, and uh, you look at uh, Tanev, uh, his defensive game, that'll help Hannafin in two ways. One, it'll allow him to be a little bit more risky, and utilize his offensive skills but he'll also learn how to play defense better and i think that'll benefit hannafin quite a bit a lot of people don't realize this but i'll just throw it out there noah hannafin's actually one year younger than rasmus anderson hannafin just entered the league so much earlier that he seems like an old pro i think he's been around for six seasons so far so yeah i mean him and anderson you're right both a lot of growth and I think the team will start, like you said, 5-4, and four, Giordano and Anderson, and then 55-8, and eight, Hannafin Tanev. But I can see in a game when the Flames are behind of throwing Gio Tanev up there if they need to, just to calm some things down. And we saw some really good chemistry from Hannafin Anderson last year. So I could also see on some special teams, those two guys yeah. getting put together. Yep. I thought they looked really good in that Winnipeg series together. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. And... You know, you might even see Valimaki slide up to that first pairing, too, just to give... Then who do you move? I mean, that's the thing. I don't disagree with you, but who do you move down to pairing three? Well, you would just uh, probably move Tanev down one, just to give, you know, like Anderson down one and Valimaki. You wouldn't do it all the time, but just to give him some looks, just to, like, encouragement more than anything. Yeah, yeah, you you definitely could. I think the Flames really like their left hand, right hand, and uh, Hannafin and Valimaki are the two are both lefties. So I think they'd probably swap those two if they want to keep the hands the same. Yeah, left hander and right hander. I think Valimaki is just because of the depth. I think he's destined to be a number six all season. Not that they won't give him a look, but I think he's destined to be a five six or a third pair guy all season. Um, but I, I think if he looks really good, it's a good problem to have for next year. Yeah, exactly. And then you, it and, makes other moves happen, so that's always good, too. Well, and I mean, we've got two years left on Geo. I'm kind of thinking that over time, you know, next year, Geo may not be in the top pair, um, and I think that you'll see him and Valley sort of switch positions next year, potentially, of Geo moving out of the top four or into the, the bottom four. And Valley moving into it. Well, uh, think back when uh, Chicago was starting to be on their ascent. They had Brian Campbell on their first pair, and then Keith and Seabrook eventually took those spots, and Campbell slid down the lineup. Mm -hmm. And I think that Giordano's going to basically be that, where he's the awesome veteran guy until the kids can take over full-time. Yeah, I disagree. One thing I think you will see a lot of this year is Giordano playing a lot... I think you'll see more of him playing less, if that makes sense. You'll see more of Gio playing less special teams men's. I think we saw Gio sort of look blown up last year and uh, out of breath a lot of times, just not playing like himself. And he's getting older. I mean, you know, he's going into his 37-year-old season, so I think you want to use him a lot five-on-five and try to use the other five guys in special teams. What do you think? Yeah, and especially with Valimaki, he's a very good offensive defenseman. I think he sees a lot of power play time. I think Hannafin sees a lot of power play time i think anderson sees a lot of power play time and you know i think geo would probably be the number four on that yeah i would i would agree of the of the defensemen i think if there's one guy who might have an unexpectedly good season this year i think it's going to be hannafin yeah i think you might have finally found him a partner that he can really excel with well that's the hope anyway and we'll see hannafin it I think this season is more or less the figuring out exactly what this player is. 
uh, like up until now, it, he's been learning at the NHL level, and like, is there a next step with Hannafin, and or is this what you've got? And mm-hmm. you know, it, and right and now, and if all we've got is a second line guy, I think he's still a good addition to the team. Yeah, for sure. But uh, and like, I wouldn't be in any rush to get rid of him by any stretch. It's just that no, you know, your expectations are, oh, okay, now he's you can pencil him safely in that 3-4 spot and leave him there. Okay, yeah. now we need a guy to replace Giordano on the first pair instead of Hannafin exactly. emerging as that guy. And so that this season will answer that question, whether he can take over for Giordano, and then you can slot Valimaki sliding up, possibly, and all that kind of stuff. And, and I don't necessarily think that Anderson is a top pair defenseman yet, but of the options available, I think he's going to become one very quickly. Yeah, same here. You know, I think on most teams, he'd be a good second pair guy. He'd be the guy to want in Tanev or Hannafin's slot, but of the four available, he's the best we got. Mm-hmm. And I think that Anderson also has a next gear. I think that he could emerge eventually as one of the better defensemen in the NHL. It's just can he take those next steps well and if you're gonna do it being paired with geo is the guy that's gonna unlock that yeah exactly so of our uh 82 million dollar salary cap 23,000 or 23 million 131,666 dollars are dedicated to the seven defensemen that was a lot of numbers to read out yes let's move to the forward shall we yeah the the interesting one group of the bunch so obviously we know sort of our top four forwards, Goudreau, Monaghan, Kachuk, Lindholm. Interesting to see, though, the way the Flames are playing them in uh, practices so far is really the first line is Kachuk on the left with Lindholm at center and various guys on the right. The latest line had Dubé there. And the second line is Goudreau, Monaghan, and Mangiapane. They've had Josh Levo up there for some looks, um, but Mangiapane is on that right side right now. Matt, you and I have talked a lot about how Sean Monahan is probably a number two center on most teams, and maybe Kachuk is the top left winger over Goudreau right now. Do you feel like the way the Flames are setting up these line combos, we're starting to see guys fit more into a natural order? Well, the Flames have the unusual benefit of having four first-line forwards. And uh, honestly, Oiko, even though Goudreau and Monahan are on the second line like they're still first line forwards the flames just happen to have two first line left wings and two first line centers now monahan he's probably more of a high-end second line center or a mid to low-ish and first line center but still that that level of quality is there and having them separate lindholm from that line gives the flames two punches one right after the other of high-end scoring forwards and with all of the defense cores in the north division uh, each of divi- each team does not have two good defense pairings so like toronto probably has the second best defense core of the canadian division and even then that that second pairing is going to have their hands full when they, they face one or the other. Like, it's going to be tough on the other teams. And spreading that wealth is what's going to separate the Flames from all of the other teams. And basically, Calgary and Toronto are the only two teams that have that firepower that they can do that. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. And I, I'm not saying that Goudreau is a second-line guy. It's just interesting to see that they've... I think for a while we've had coaches that didn't want to move those guys off the top line. And, I mean, top line means different things to different people. But I think this is more, based on what we saw last year, maybe more the natural order of the roster, not necessarily the who's paid the most. Yeah. And Kachuk, I feel, is ready for quote-unquote first-line minutes. Honestly, mm-hmm. I think that you'll end up seeing the first and second line getting basically the same amount of minutes anyway. But... You know, it's good to see, and it's good to see Lindholm being used as a center, because I think that he could be a very good first-ish, second-line center himself. 
and we have a lot of good and interesting options on the right side, and I'm very good glad to see Dubé and Mangiapane getting shots on that right side. Well, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's go back to Lindholm first. Lindholm played right wing most of last season. They tried him a little bit at center. I think he's probably stayed on right wing longer than they intended because this team, arguably, if you look at our roster, probably has the least depth on the right wing. Um, so he's played there. Would you rather see with this lineup Lindholm at center, or do you think we center, need him on the right? Center, all the way center. Um, I've never been of the opinion that you need to have right shooting right wingers. Like, to me, wingers are good on either side. Like, yeah, ideally, you would have right shooters, but skill is the thing that matters most. And I think that the Flames now have enough skilled wingers, period, that you can move Lindholm to center without worrying so much. Because, like, neither Dubé or Mangiapane are right shooters. But, you know, they're both skilled enough where having them on the right side makes perfect sense okay and then i guess dubay Japani you mentioned do you feel like these guys are if if we're looking at calgary as a contender this year do you think these guys are top six players on a contender or are they just the best we've got right now um Manjapane, yes dubay i think could easily uh i think that Manjapane actually is a top six forward in the nhl uh, he was very good uh, all of last season, and I think that he's taken those next steps, that he needs more of a, a cemented opportunity to see whether or not he's a second-line forward or a first-line forward. And Dubé, he, I, he, him, I think he's at currently more of a third-line guy, but he has that upward potential as well, and so why not see... The Flames do have plenty of options, whether it's Sam Bennett, Josh Levo, uh, and a few other guys that they could, put, you know, like Peltier, uh, potentially. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll talk about Peltier a little bit later. Um, but I think if I look at them, I agree with you about Dubé. To me, going into the season, he's a third-line center. Not say he's always going to be a third-line center, but I don't think he's the guy I want on my number one line or my starting lineup. I think Mangiapane for sure, I would say is a second line center right now in his career. But I think if I was going to the season, I would do Kachuk, Lindholm, Mangiapane as line one. Yep. Goudreau, Monahan, Levo as line two. I think Levo brings some interesting uh, dynamic to that line. Lucic, Backlund, Bennett as line three. And then uh, Ryan, Nordstrom, and whoever else you want on the fourth line. Yeah. For me, I, I would... With that second line, I would be... I guess fourth line would be where Dubé would end up. Yeah, uh, that's that second line, to me, on the right side, um, to me, I, I would put either Bennett or Dubé there. And on the third line, Lucic, Backlund, and the other. Of I think in, in that case, you've got to go with Dubé there, because I think the chemistry we saw with Backlund and Lucic last year, I don't want to break up. Yeah. Same here. Like, I think those those two, you've... I, I'm starting to look, and we've heard coaches say this, I'm starting to look at pairs again on this team. Like, a Chuck Lindholm, I think, will be a pair. Goudreau, Monaghan are a pair. Lucic, Bennett are a pair. Mm -hmm. You know, I think your top three lines, you got pairs that you'll shift guys around. Yeah. I know. it. It's interesting how this team's going to be set up. And they're kind of in this weird phase. Like, as bad as it sounds, like, having... The Flames have too many centers at the moment. And um, like with Ryan, Bennett, uh, Backlund, Monaghan, Lindholm, like the Flames, you know, it, I, in the expansion draft, likely Michael Backlund is going to be the guy that Seattle picks. I would agree, yeah. So, you know, that would be a sol problem that will kind of solve itself uh, down the road. And... Bennett, I think, would be the natural fit as the center with Lucic and whomever the winger on that line would be. Um, but with Backlund being there, I, it kind of throws a bit of a wrench into things. But that's a... You know, like, honestly, I think that if you're going to have Bennett as the center, I think that having Lucic on the fourth line with Bennett would make a little more sense even 
And at the same time, I think we're going to, and I mentioned this at the top of the show, I think we're going to see more roster churn this year. We're going to see more guys hurt, more guys sitting out, more guys, you know, stuff like that. And I would rather have Backland as the third line center who I know can step up to a top six yeah. for two, three games than I would rather have Bennett in that spot. True. And, you know, so I think at least for this year, I'm glad that Backland is the third, but $5 million is a lot to pay your third line center going forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, with the guys on the right side, well, all the wingers, frankly, like, it's. Especially on the bottom six, all of the wingers, I think, can swap in and around. And, mm -hmm. like, I, I like the idea of Derek Ryan with Bennett, or I'm not Bennett, Backlund on the third line and like have because i think you could see that as a shutdown pk unit but i don't know if i do that five on five yeah well ryan's good as in a similar way as backland as a good two-way forward and so you know it would depend on who you'd have on the left side of that line you know if you had had a more of a scoring player on the left side like say dube i think that might work yeah, I don't know I want Dubé playing that low in the lineup, though. Yeah, it's one of those where... Unless you're rolling lines, Dubé's not getting enough time. Yeah, it's tough. Like, there's so many permutations with the... That I think, and you're, I think you're going to see that happen through the season with... Because there's so much that's fungible with this team that... I mean, if you want to move Lucic to line four, I would make line three Dubé, Backland, Levo... And then line four, I do Lucic, Bennett, Ryan. Yeah, that would work. If you want to go that way. Again, sort of keeping our pairs together. Yeah, that would be um, a good setup. You know, and I think if you look at the fourth line, quote unquote, is the energy line. I think having Lucic and Bennett there would be a good way to go. Bennett, I think, has shown he's a better winger than uh, Ryan has shown he's a better winger. So I would start Bennett on the on the wing, let him swap with Ryan at center when we need to if Ryan gets thrown out of the circle. Um, but I think that, yeah, I think my fourth line of Bennett, Lucic, Ryan, I think could surprise people. Yeah. Um, and, and I think when I look at this lineup, I think – at least on paper, and we've said this in the past, but I think there's some potential for the bottom six of this team to put up some more points than we've seen in the past. Often we've seen the bottom six having to carry the team because the top six didn't do their job. Well, But I think with I think guys like the, Backland, Levo, Bennett, I think we could see some points come from the bottom six. Yeah, and I think that that's one of the marks of a team that's more of an elite team. Like, you look at a team like Tampa Bay, they had four lines that could contribute. And... You generally like the best teams in the NHL are teams that get contributions from everywhere, and you know if your top six heavy, if your top six is great, great, you'll be a playoff team. But if you're not getting any help at all from your third and fourth line, you're kind of you'll as the playoffs go on, you're gonna get hosed eventually. And it, you look at like past years, St. Louis had four good lines. Washington had four good lines, and you can just keep going back. Like, all of the cup winners in recent memory, they all had four good lines. And Calgary will have four good lines. So that's a good thing for this team. It's not like the Flames or the Oilers where they have two good players and then who knows. <laughs> I think that if we look at... You know, if we look at the team on paper, I think you're right. And if we have four good lines, we can start to roll the lines a lot more. And I think that really gives us the ability to not have to worry so much about, you know, oh, this guy's on the fourth line. This guy's not, um, you know, going to get as many minutes. Because if you're rolling the lines, everyone should get similar minutes. So I think that gives a lot more options. Yeah, and it also, like, with the condensed nature of the schedule, having that ability to roll four lines more... Uh, will decrease the wear and tear and all of those kinds of things. It's not like, like honestly, like if Edmonton tries to roll McDavid and Dreisaitl for 25 minutes like they did last year, like those players are going to die from exhaustion because <laughs> like it, it's just, yeah, it's not feasible to do that consistently. You and I had this discussion last year more times than I can count. If the Flames run the lineup that we just talked about with Kachuk, Lindholm as the first line and Goudreau Monaghan on the second line, does it feel a little bit like maybe this is the 
Gujo being put on a short string, and if he's not performing, I mean, we talked about maybe it's the right time to move him now, especially, I think, with the cap peril that we're seeing in the league. You could really get a lot for a top left winger making less than $7 million. Do you feel like maybe this is the, the time to strike while the iron's hot on Gujo? If, then, maybe. Like, if Gujo is just kind of being adequate, and it makes sense, sure. You know... Would you would you move Goudreau to get a right winger of a similar caliber? It would depend on the situation, but you know, like I think at this point, if you're going to move Goudreau, um, like say towards the end of the season or at the draft, I I think that you're wanting to get younger a bit, uh, just to have everybody more in the Kachuk age group, more so than the Goudreau age group. It's a couple of years, but it makes a difference and. Here's an interesting deal I was uh, chatting about on the weekend. Would you move Goudreau for Eberly? Oh, no. Not at all. No? Zero chance. Bring in... I mean, Eberly's a 50-point guy in, in uh, New York. Yeah. Uh, unless New York is adding, like, their top three prospects or multiple first-rounders, no. Well, I mean, you, you could get something with it. I don't know if you're going to get a top prospect or a bunch of picks, yeah. but a player like that to shore up the top six of the right. Yeah, no. Uh, that that's a big step down, on okay. But that's like a magnitude, like would be talked about in the, the Gilmore esque or Phaneuf esque level of bad. <laughs> sure, I think if you're looking at players that are expendable, well, not expendable, but players they might look to move this year, I think Goudreau and Backlund would be those two guys that you could move out if they're not having a great season and still be able to fill around. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Like, if you traded Backlund, you know, like, uh, as much as it would be disappointing, you know, and, like, casually mentioning, like, oh, that would be the guy that would we'd lose in the expansion draft, I would be pissed at losing Michael Backlund. Like, don't get me wrong. I like mm -hmm. him a lot as a player. It's just values there. Yeah. And I think that um, with Backlund... If the Flames lost him either via the expansion draft or trading him, like you have Sam Bennett, who could easily fill that third line spot yeah. without really skipping that much of a beat. Like, would it be a step down? Yes. Would it be a huge disaster? No. And and I guess a guy like Backlund, you're right, the value's there. And I would rather move him and get value than lose him for nothing. I think we saw a great example of that when Pittsburgh lost Flurry, right? I mean, there was talk that Calgary was willing to give them something for Flurry, and they still lost him for nothing. So if they think Backlund's the guy that's going to be unprotected, I'd rather move him and get something. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And so would I. And Backlund... And I don't think you get a fourth for him. Like, I think you can get a considerable piece for Michael Backlund. Oh, there are 30 teams that would love Michael Backlund in their lineup. Getting good two-way centers is impossible to find yeah and, and yeah he's over like getting over five million that's perfectly fine for a guy like michael backlund mm -hmm. it's just that you know he would likely be the guy that the flames would lose in the expansion draft yeah and you know truthfully we are going to have to pay manjapan and dube you know yeah and like you said, moving him puts Bennett in that spot, who I think is serviceable for a year, but it also opens up down the road a spot for Glenn Godden or somebody like that, who right now there's really not a spot for. Yeah, and the or Connor Zary, you know, down yeah, the road. If like, you think he's NHL ready. Yeah, like two, two years down the road, that kind of thing. And, you know, the Flames are going to, like... Almost like uh, how like they reallocated some cap towards like uh, filling Goaltending. like the goalie position, mm -hmm. and I think that like reallocating some of that five million dollars to the right side would make sense. And if the Flames were to make a trade involving Backlund, I would assume that it would be for a second line right winger of some caliber. Like a, a yeah, Michael and, Backlund. And I also don't know you need to bring in somebody's current second line winger. I think you could bring a guy like Lindholm, who is probably not used as well as they could have been, yeah. and got elevated when they got here. I think you could bring in somebody's third line right winger and put him with Monaghan and Goudreau and make him look better than he should be. Yeah, exactly. Like a prospect somewhere that's not being utilized quite right. And, 
And I, and I think the nice thing about doing that too, if you bring in somebody's third line winger, now you might be able to bring in a bit of a lesser winger and get a pick for it. Yeah. You know, somebody say third line winger and a third or something like that. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, and I think you're also then looking about the salary range you'd want to go to, jump from about 5'5 five, five to 2'5 um, and free up some cash. But, yeah, I mean, I, I hate to say it, but I think Backlund is the guy that when I look at this team, I could see potentially not being a flame at the end of the year. Yeah, and it would be disappointing because, you know, Backlund is one of my favorite flames and has been for since we drafted him. It's just you know business and numbers at this point and it'd be disappointing but at the same time you know if you move them you'd get a uh you'd get an impressive return yeah you're not gonna move backland for a seventh you know like if you move them yeah you, it's sad to see him go but you know you'll be excited by whatever we get back yeah oh yeah and like it, it's one of those things that like the flames could even move him uh before the, the expansion draft or anything like that as well like keep him through the season and you know, yeah, we'll see. Yeah, you know, like that. I don't know. I my worry with Backlund is how he's going to play with reduced minutes. Well, he should be we've fine. Se- like he used to play third line minutes, and well, but we've seen him sort of go onto the third line in the playoffs and stuff in the past, and he sort of seemed like he was unhappy there and that sort of thing. And I'm just worried if he's going to be become a bit of a pain for the coaches. Well, then problems so- solve themselves in a way. Yeah. So with that, we, we've we talked about the forwards, the defensemen, and the goalies. There's six more players that we normally don't have to talk about, and that's our six-man taxi squad. This is a COVID rule. The Flames get to carry six guys who don't have to be, uh, who don't have to have that 10-day quarantine to come up or down. These are six guys that are essentially like your practice squad in the NFL. We still have to pay them. We, they still travel with us, but they're not actively in the lineup. But I believe you can still move any of them in and out. There's no... You have to put guys, they have to be sent on waivers to go into the taxi squad, but not to come back. So, Matt, how would you allocate that taxi squad? Whether names or positions, you've got six guys. How many forwards, defense, and goalies? Uh, I would do one, two, three. Three forwards, two defensemen, one goalie. I think that's about right, yeah. I, I want to carry an extra pair of defensemen in case you get hurt. Yeah. So, um, like, Shillington think- and Stone kind of thing. Yeah, and, and I can see moving some guys in and out of that. I can see the team starting with two forwards because I think there's more forwards that we're not sure if they should be here. Like, I think just looking at the lineup, I think, um, you know, we didn't talk about Dom- Dominique Simone, who I think will be on that lineup too. Um, but I can see I can see them starting with two one and one and eventually going to one, two, and one. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, th- I think one goalie, you need one goalie, and I think it'll be Louis Domingue unless he gets claimed. Um and there's, it's interesting to think about too. And I don't know your thoughts on this, but a lot of people would say put, you know, some of the guys like Glenn Godden on that taxi squad. But to me, I want those guys that need the play time, and I'd classify Godden one of them playing in Stockton. I'd rather have my taxi squad guys like Byron Ferrosi or Buddy Robinson, yeah, or guys or like that we know, guys like last year, like uh, Alan Quine, that kind of guy. Yeah, like Zach Ronaldo. Yeah, perfect guys that you know can step in and play two, three games and they're just fine. Yeah. You know, and a guy like, um, you know, a guy like Glenn Godden, while he's close, I think he's still better off being in stock. Yeah. Same here. Same thing on the defensive side. I think there'll be a question of should uh, Oliver Shillington be the number seven or should he go down to Stockton? And I think there's some other options there as well. But it'll be it'll be interesting to see how well they use that taxi squad and how often those guys are actually getting played. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the lineup. I think that pretty much covers the entire lineup. The other big change that we saw was uh, in the in the coaching staff. So we saw Jeff Ward come in as head coach this year. They dropped the interim label. And we saw Jason LaBarbera come in as the goalie coach with Jordan Siglet moving to the head of the goaltending department. So let's break these down one at a time. Your thoughts on Ward getting the head coaching job? Adequate. Um, I didn't think that he did a particularly bad job or a good job uh when he took over it it's not enough information like he hasn't been a head coach in the nhl uh so it's wait and see uh, i think we're at the end of the rope with blaming the coach for our failures yeah. like you know how often have we oh this team didn't do well let's fire the coach i think we're at the point where if this team doesn't do well again we can't just say, well, fire Jeff Ward. I think that's when you've got to start looking at Goudreau's and Monaghan's oh, yeah. and this is, guys that have been here for a while. Yeah, 
now it's personnel entirely like from this point forward like mm -hmm. yeah like uh, that's uh you just have to move stuff at that point and cycle i think ward is good enough i mean like you said we don't have a lot of information but i think he's good enough but i i just don't think you can i i was talking to someone about it and they said yeah he's good enough for one year and then he'll get fired i think we're out of time to yeah no. to keep firing coaches i think that the flames basically they just need to keep like now it's entirely on the players and like there's no r more, real more excuses like they should have beat dallas last year they didn't and they failed in the same way that they did against colorado it's like okay if this happens again then okay yeah now it's personnel issues let's go and yeah and I know you and I talked about should this team have been gutted in the offseason. I think if the Flames don't do well this year, you'll see that gut come this offseason. Yeah, you'll definitely. see Goudreau, Monaghan, a lot of those guys moved. Yeah, a, a huge turnover. Like even a mini rebuild, if you want to call it that. Well, well, I think you would move a lot of the long-standing pieces. Yeah. You know, guys that you could blame for that. Dubé, Mangiapane, those guys haven't been here long enough. Um, Lindholm, Kachuk, those guys haven't been here long enough. But you got to look at who are the guys that have systematically, you know, lost the confidence in every coach we've had, and maybe it's their fault. Yeah, and cycle it, you know, like let guys like Peltier come in, Matthew Phillips, and like all the young prospects that are in, and, you know, like if, that, if that's the case, and go on to the next phase of the Flames if, the flames can't yeah you know and let those guys get an opportunity to figure out if they're guys that can be contributed towards for or even free agents i mean if you yeah. don't think those guys are ready yet go out and find a free agent that can do it yep something and i mean it's not like we're just gonna drop goudreau if you move him you'd get something for him so it's just maybe changing that piece for a different piece yeah and you sometimes see teams have that kind of a thing well where you need to go through several permutations sort of like st louis where they made a lot of roster changes and more roster changes followed by some roster changes until they got it right and then now they'll make some more roster changes yes exactly <laughs> well let's talk about the goalie coaches so jason la barbera uh been around the nhl for a long time at his first nhl season in 2000 2001 when he played one game for the rangers and his last NHL season in 14-15 when he played five games for the Ducks. He's been here in Calgary since 16-17 as the goalie coach for the Hitmen and now the goalie coach for the Calgary Flames. Jordan Siegel is being moved to the head of the goaltending department, whatever that means. Uh, basically, me, really with, like uh, just to finish, like sure. uh, contribute to that thought, uh, Siglet's job basically is to find goalies. Um, he found Riddick. Um, he found Chechilev. Uh, the goalie that the Flames drafted in the fourth round this past season, and he seems to have a decent eye for young goalies, and so he's, he's, his job is basically less day-to-day -day and more of scouting and seeing and evaluating and all that kind of thing. Yeah, I've also been told he is sort of the director of player development for the goalies. He's the one who's going to be watching the goalies in the system, telling them what they need to work on, working with the goalie coaches at all the levels to make sure that those things are being followed through. And you and I have seen him do that really well at the rookie camps. He's often working with the young goalies. He's talking to them as they get off the ice. He's making sure those guys are there. I personally think that La Barbera has a little more – pedigree to be an NHL goalie coach I mean if you look at this guy he's never really been a starter he played 44 games for the Kings in 7-8 but this guy has been around the league forever Jordan Siglet played one NHL game in his career for Boston in 05-06 like if I'm Markstrom or someone like that I don't know I would give a little more credit to late Jason LaBarbera helping coach me up for the NHL level what do you think well uh, honestly I have never had a problem that like so many people have had with Jordan Siglet. Uh, I've always thought he did a decent job. It it's also hard when the caliber of goaltenders that the Flames have had since Kipper, like it's been a tire fire, frankly. And you know it's hard. But there's a lot of goalies that I think we could say underachieved under Siglet. Uh, I can't really like. He was given a pile of mediocre and. Frankly, like Riddick has developed into a quality NHL goalie under his watch, 
like you know you look at failures of certain prospects like mason mcdonald and uh john gillies amongst others and like gillies for example was derailed by injuries sort of like what parsons has yep, undergone parsons and injuries you know and like stuff like that is beyond your control sometimes you have goalies that just are not very good like mason mcdonald and you know that kind of thing happens and the team though on the overall i think that the goaltending has been adequate enough um and i like i i've never actually viewed the goaltending coaching as being the problem i you know it's more the personnel in that case um so lab- but i guess when i'm talking about the the guys underachieving like he was the nhl um goalie coach the other guys working with the ahl goalie coach but go all the way back to 14 15 carry ramo Jonas hiller i think you could say both guys under I, I thought they both played above their head actually uh yeah. in 14 15 um everybody figured out that hiller couldn't catch anything from the blue line in 15 16 and so th- that's why he went off and ramo got hurt Otherwise, I think that that would have been a lot different of a season. Uh, Yanni Ordi. And then those same guys played together the next year. We had Brian Elliott, Chad Johnson uh, in 16-17. Uh, Elliott definitely underperformed, but I don't know if that's Siglet's problem or not. Well, Elliott was just horrible in the playoffs. Like, he, he was fine, and Johnson was fine during the, the season. Like, there was no real problem with either of them. Um it's just that Elliot in the playoffs just imploded and entirely cost us that series. I think that the flames. Yeah. I I guess that's just kind of the story we've seen is, you know, Hiller imploded, Elliot imploded, Smith imploded. Like you wonder if we're just bringing in the wrong goalies or if it's the way they're being coached. That's entirely the case. Marginal goalies that just sucked. And it's not because of the goalie coach. It's just that you're dealing with mediocre goalies and, um, th- that's kind of a problem when with a lot of teams like they just it, unless they get that guy like a Jonathan Quick or whatever m- you know mediocre goalies are mediocre goalies and you know it is what it is like and uh, that's basically since Kipper that's all the Flames have had is just fringy starters and that you know yeah that's true that's what you're unfortunately going to get is mediocre goalies give you mediocre performances when it matters and it looks so far like la barbera and markstrom have some good chemistry so i would imagine that la barbera will be here as long as uh, markstrom wants him here yep so that's the coaching changes the rest of the coaching staff stays the same uh ray edwards has moved officially into the coaching team now which we saw last season so he'll be behind the bench and work with the players um but let's we'll get to our season prediction game that we always play in just a minute here. But let's let me ask you three questions. If you have any questions about the season, you can add them in as well. Who do you think was the biggest loss for the Flames this off season? Honestly, I don't think they had one. I would say Cam Talbot. I think Markstrom's definitely a good starter, but I would be more comfortable with Markstrom Talbot than Markstrom Riddick. Yeah. Um, I viewed that more as a one for one, like kind of a trade in in a way. Okay. So, you know, it's. And I think if you're going into the season, I mean, I know it'd be hard to juggle um, budget wise, but if you were running Markstrom, Talbot, Riddick as your three, you'd have a really good pair. But I think you would also have been able to move Riddick for something if he kept Talbot. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, Talbot just wanted to be a number one guy, and he is going to be in Minnesota. So, yeah, which uh, you but know, uh, you know, honestly, if, if it was me, I would be wanting the number one job as well. So, like, mm-hmm. it, you know, no fault to him for going. No, you know, I, I and, actually, and I'm I glad think... that he got a con as good of a contract as he did. So me too. I think he's got to be happy with that contract. I mean, he came to Calgary looking as a one, a one B guy. He, I think rejuvenated himself in Calgary and good for him for playing his way into a big money deal. Yeah, exactly. I'm always thrilled when a guy, you know, we replaced him with somebody better and he gets to make a boatload of money. Awesome. 
you know, win-win for both sides. Yeah. For, for those that don't know, Cam Talbot went to Minnesota. He's on a three-year deal. He's 33 on a three-year deal, making 3.66 average a year. Yep. So bigger money than I'd want to pay for my backup. Yep. Um, where do you think the Flames are still weak lineup wise? Uh, I think the biggest weakness overall is their defense core, but that's just due to the fact that they have an inexperienced guy on all three pairs, and that will solve itself over time. Um, the the forward group is good one through twelve. I, I the Flames really don't have a ton of weaknesses overall and I'm expecting them to be one of the elite teams in the NHL this season. Um, right there with Tampa, frankly. Um, I'm going to say that one of our weaknesses, I think, is still a high-end right winger. I think that, well, you know, Mongepani's there, while, you know, maybe uh, Dubé's there, maybe Lebo's there. There's a lot of maybes on that right side, and I think that they're still missing a, a bona fide... They're, they have arguably two bona fide lefts. They have arguably two bona fide centers, they have maybe one bona fide right winger, and I think that that's one area that we might see biting them. Yeah, uh, I think that um, I'm going to prorate this over 82 games uh, that Manjapane will have an equivalent 25 plus goal season this year. Okay. Yeah, it could be, but even then, that's one. Yeah, and I think Dubé won't be far off. I think he'll be more of like a 18 to 20 goal ish right winger and, and i'm not i'm not denying that but i think looking at the roster as it sits now that's my big question mark oh for that sure right i'm not it, saying it, i'm not sure. saying guys couldn't grow into that just like i think you know valamaki could grow into an elite defenseman yeah but as of right now on the 10th of january yeah i have questions about that right side yeah and like you know ideal situation was would be that you would get trade Backlund for an equivalently talented right winger and throw him on the second line. As you mentioned earlier, maybe that right side gets fixed internally and then we trade Backlund for a, you know, a bottom six piece with potential. Mm -hmm. Somebody else is Sam Bennett, if you will. Um, the last question I'll ask you here is, would you put Zari and Peltier on the taxi squad or send them to the HL roster until the Canadian Hockey League reopens? Um... Because I think they're making an exception this year that you can send young guys to the A. I would actually, uh, Zari, I would put him in the AHL right off. And I think Peltier I'd actually have in the NHL starting lineup for the nine-game audition or whatever the equivalent is this year. Who do you take out? Um, Nordstrom, Simon? Yeah, those two guys. Uh, and I, I would actually give Peltier a good sh spot on the lineup as well to... As the audition, you know, like uh, the third line right wing or some such to, okay, you, here, this is what this is going to take. Learn these lessons and then go to the AHL or wherever after. And I just think that with the depth we have in that bottom six, I'm not sure that we need Pelche there. Oh, I think it, it's I'd be... not a matter of need. It's... I, how but if you're putting him in a good spot, as you say, who are you sitting out? Whose season maybe are you stalling to give him those nine games? Well, frankly, like guys like Nordstrom and Simon, they're more your quintessential 13th forward at this point. So them both missing out on a little bit of time to allow a kid to get some time in the NHL. Like, Peltier had a really good world juniors and i think that mm -hmm. encouraging him with a few games to let him get a taste of the nhl and sink or swim you know uh, let him see what it's like and i think that if he's to get a proper shot he needs some minutes like not like fourth line you know give him an actual shot and you know even if it's just a couple of games like the first three games of the season before the five game five day break, just to let him wet his feet a bit and carry on. You and I have always deferred on this. I'm not a fan of bringing the young guys up too early. I think I'd send them both to the A and let them work things out there. Um, I think too often, and I've said this before too. I think we we didn't do Bennett any favors bringing him up early, and and I think that well, I I know what you're saying. I think that it might be better to just send them both to the A and let them work with development coaches. Yeah. Um, how would you say, uh, 
normally I, I agree with you. I just think that Peltier's game is getting to the point where he is an NHL player. And, you know, so giving him that encouragement at, would be a good teaching tool. Like, it, I'm assuming that he plays the bulk of the season in the AHL. It's just, I think that for a while, having him even just getting a game or two to get the feel of what the NHL is, I think would. So he's 19. I don't think he's AHL el- eligible, but I think they're letting them hang on to them until this CHL yeah. season starts. So, I mean, I, I think in that case, when February comes around, you send him back to be the big fish in the small pond in, uh, in the CHL. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. You go either way with it. I just, I, I would also worry about bringing him up too early and then, um, he gets hurt or something. And that's always a risk though. Yeah. It's one of those things with that either way makes sense. If that makes sense. Like if you go AHL right away until junior start, that's a perfectly valid and good idea. And it, giving him a little bit of a taste at the NHL level if he's showing in the few days between now and the uh, 14th. If he's showing enough then to get a shot. That I, I would be okay to give him one, maybe two of those three games, especially because we see the Canucks twice in there. Um, but I think you got to make a decision at that point. I don't mm-hmm. want him hanging around as a... I think after that five-day break, we have to have our taxi squad figured out. Yeah, exactly. Um, and just to go back to what I was saying earlier about uh, salary cap, because I forgot. So our forwards, 13 of them are taking up 46728333 So right now we have just under a million left in the cap. Mm-hmm. Well, Matt, let's uh, do some quick predictions here. These are the same predictions you and I do almost every year, and we'll look at these again. I would say at Christmas time, but that's past. So at our halfway point, probably late March. Uh, who do you think is going to have a breakout season for the Flames? Uh, Andrew Mangiapane. I think he emerges as an actual first line forward. Interesting. I think Mangiapane was expected to have a good season, so I'm not going to say that he's going to be a breakout guy. I think the guy that might surprise there would be Josh Lebo. I think we might see more out of Lebo than we expect. I also think for a guy that can play all three center, all three forward positions, I think you might see him in a lot more situations than we might some other guys. Who do you think is going to struggle this season? David Riddick. Do you think he struggles just because he's he's trying too hard to become the starter yeah. or get starter minutes? I think that he just struggles because he's before he was like the one A one B and now he's clearly the B, and so you know it's not. Uh, I think that might mess with him mentally and how he approaches. Do so you the think game. just that idea of being demoted might sort of make him struggle? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Um, it's interesting. I was looking back at who you and I thought were going to struggle, and more often than not, we've said Sam Bennett. But I think that the expectations of Bennett have been tempered. Um, uh, actually, so I- I'm going to disagree with you there. I think that he's finally going to start coming into his own. <laughs> I think he's going to come into his own, but I think that what we expect he's going to be has been tempered, as opposed to he's the you know he's such a high pick he could be a you know number one line guy. Yeah. I still think he has a second line upside. It's just, you know, figuring him. He has to figure himself out and how to be effective. And, you know, we'll see. I'm going to go with a slightly different uh, pick here. I think that Johnny Goudreau is going to struggle a bit. I don't think he's going to get like 20 goals. But I think with Kachuk being that number one guy, I think that you might see Goudreau struggle this year not get the numbers used to he's also a guy who often needs some time to get going and we don't have time to get going yeah um good i think uh, i think he'll have average ish numbers for him like i don't i think that um the and i think Goudreau's is also going to struggle in the playoffs which we've seen as well like i think we've seen that he just doesn't respond the way he needs uh, to this past uh, playoffs i thought he was better than he has been and you know, like less. Uh, he was better than he had than he had been, but not good enough to be the top guy. Yeah, to send us exactly. To the second round. And like that's where 
how would you say? I think that Goudreau is going to actually take the uh, sort of like how Ovechkin changed his game a couple years ago to be better overall. I think that you're going to see Goudreau placing more emphasis on being more of a complete-ish forward. Not necessarily like a good defensive forward or anything. Mm -hmm. But, um... I think you'll see that starting. I don't know that... I think you'll see struggles while he's trying to do that. Yeah, and I think that... Like, I honestly, I think that, like, the first line and the second line thing, it's going to be, like, an interchangeable, and, like, all four of those guys are going to be on the first power play unit anyway. So, like, uh, it's one of those things where, like, uh, you know, I think, like, they're both going to get, like, 18 minutes a night, give or take. Sure. It, you know, and so, like... Uh, I think Sean Monahan tried to become a more complete player last year, and we saw him struggle a little bit. I think he was thinking too much on the ice. Yeah, and I think that you're... And that's and that's where I think Johnny might be this year, too. Yeah. And, you know, Goudreau did play a lot better defensively in the po- playoffs. So, you know, if he can find that more complete ish effort like i think that that would better him overall as a forward um, i don't disagree i just don't know that you can find that. yeah we'll see like this will this is a, it gonna be an interesting season for Gaudreau. uh i think that um if he can figure things out he'll cement himself as a reliable top six forward indefinitely for the flames until you know, it, his career is winding down. Um, whether or not he can figure that out is the questions that will be answered, and whether or not he is a flame next season. Like, if he is another, like, has another semi selfish season and is just like all offense, no defense, and just, and not dare fully sort of like what we saw at times last season then you move on but you know if he can figure out that right mix and mix things up in his game instead of being so repetitive with his moves then I think that you know he'll be a mainstay for a long time it's just like everything question is just can he do that yeah he's one of the big question marks on this roster for the long term and the short term but I still would expect him to have, like, a 75-plus point, like, over 82 game uh, season. What, how that, you know, how he plays during that, who the hell knows. I hope you're right. Do you think both goalies will stay healthy? Yeah. I, I'm going to say that I think Markstrom's healthy because he's, tr- he's pretty solid. I think Riddick goes down at some point, and we have to find – uh, someone else to play eight to ten games. Yeah, possible. I think you'll see. I think you'll see Riddick get more time because of all the back to backs and stuff. But I think that he's going to go out at some point. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier of a fifty six game season. How many starts do you think Markstrom gets? Thirty five to forty. Okay, I'm going to say forty. Um, I, I think. 15 games for the other guy or guys is about where you want them to be. And that's, I think, sort of equivalent to what we normally see ratio wise in 82 game season. Yeah. Who do you think will be the first call up? Let's say not from the taxi squad, but from Stockton. Uh, Connor Mackey. Why do you think Mackey? I think that if needed, he could play in the NHL right now. Okay, so he's on defense. Do you want to pick a forward as well? Uh, up front, probably Glenn Godden, um, just because he's the most versatile. It's tough to know who's going to be on the taxi squad and who's not, so I'm going to go with guys I think won't be there. I yeah, think I'm, Oliver I'm just Sh- going like based off of young guy only because I'm assuming that like the taxi squad's just going to be all veteran guys. Yeah. I think uh, Shillington will come up before Mackey, and I think he'll start in the A, just because I think they know what they've got with him. Um, and he has some NHL experience, and I'll go with Glenn Godden as well. I think before Godden, you'll see a guy like Robinson or something put in, but I think those will be taxi squad guys. 
Yeah, I not um, I'm not sure that Shillington starts the year in the A. I think he's going to be the six seven guy. So we'll see. Yeah. If then, yeah, you know, then I agree mm. with you. It's just yeah. Who do you think's the first guy to get traded? Uh, I'd have to go with Backlund. Yeah. Um, Every year, you and I go with the guy we think will make the biggest splash, and they never end up being the first guy traded. Yeah. It's always some minor move for yeah, something. Yeah, uh, well, that's the thing. Like, it's probably going to be some guy like, oh, Dominic Simon got traded for a seventh round pick. You know, it's like, okay. Yeah. I'm going to go a little bit off the board. I think it's going to be Nikita Nesterov. Yeah, that works. I think he's. I, I think you might see Nesterov not look as good as he did coming back from Russia, and I think you could see a Brett Kulak like move where you uh, move him so you don't need to wave him and trade him for a six or something. Yeah. Well, um. I. I just. I don't think Backlund gets moved until near the deadline, and I think there's going to be a deal before that. Quite possible. Where Where will the Calgary Flames finish in the regular season in the North Division? Brought to you by Scotia Bank. That's a mouthful. Yeah. The Canadian division. Numero uno. You think first? Yep. I think they'll finish either first or second in the entire NHL, actually. Wow. Yeah. I kinda like my um, I kinda like Markstrom a bit, so The Flames have a good team on paper, but how many years have you and I said this? I think that they're gonna disappoint down the stretch, and I think that one long uh, I think, losing streak I think is think gonna... that the thing that'll stop that is Markstrom. I think that's the equalizer. I hope you're right. I'm going to go with third. I think that this team's going to slip a little bit, um, but I still think they'll be in the top four. Who do you what do you put ahead of them? Toronto. And it's tough to know number two. I think Montreal has some potential. Um, I think Toronto. I think for sure, I think Calgary and Toronto will be battling one two most of the season, um, but that's the thing. I'm not sure who number two would be. There's not a lot of great teams. I could see Edmonton making a decent goal, but if they can find a goalie, yeah. Well, like that. That's the weird thing with this division. Like all five of the other teams, other than Toronto and Calgary, are the teams that you would normally see like sixth to twelfth in the conference. Yeah, and so it's kind of hard to. If Matt Murray has a good year, I think Ottawa is going to surprise and could be fourth. Yeah, yeah, like my and thing, my I'd... four teams would be um, Calgary, Toronto, Edmonton, and Ottawa. Yeah, I think it's either going to be Calgary, Toronto, Edmonton, Ottawa, or it'll be Calgary, Montreal, um, Ottawa. Calgary. So I think it'll be the three Easterns in Calgary or a split Calgary Edmonton and then the two Easterns. Yeah. I think Ottawa could surprise this year if if they get a good play out of uh, Murray. Yeah. I was surprised with how much they tried to build their team in the offseason for a team that's been so stinky. Yeah. Well, Ottawa, I think getting Stutzel, I think that'll actually really help their team significantly. So, um yeah, no, I think Ottawa is going to be better than what people expect, and I think the Oilers are going to be far worse than what they expect. I think the big surprise this year, I think a lot of people are overestimating Vancouver. Yeah, I, I do too. Like, they lost their number one goalie and their best defenseman, like defensive defenseman. And, you know, like, Quinn Hughes is good, but, you know, like, they don't have... The Canucks remind me of the Oilers. They have a couple of good pieces, but not a good team. Yeah. And relying on Demko and Holtby to be awesome in the pipes, like, it could happen, but... If Vancouver's good, it's because they got really good goaltending. Yeah, uh, and it, yeah, I just, I don't like the makeup of that team, and I think um, they're like the uh, slightly low-rent version of Edmonton, where, uh, you know some good parts but no depth and you know getting decent goaltending well let's uh, stay on this idea of the flames potentially being number one in the in the northern division brought to you by scotia bank and how many points do you think the flames will get this season um 112 is the number that's on that's you can get total this year uh 74 74 okay 
I'm going to say 68. Um, and it's, it's weird to think like usually you have to get about 112 to get into the playoffs. This year 112 is if you win everything. Yeah. Well, 112 gonna, is the president's trophy generally, but Yeah, well that's it. Like, you know, you'd have to win every game to get 112 this year. So it's going to be a weird year. Yeah. Um how far do you think the Flames will go in the playoffs? Um you know, and I'm going to say this and you know, this time with I already have I, Stanley Cup written down for you. Honestly, if it's not in the Stanley Cup final, uh, this season has been an epic failure. They've solved the goaltending issue. Their team up front is not marginally different. There is no excuse. And if they're not, like, they're in co- full contender mode. Like, Monaghan and Goudreau are at prime age. They have the depth. They have the depth on the blue line. They have one of the top goalies in the NHL. There is absolutely zero excuse for them not to go on a depth run. And, like, this is, uh, you know, if the they don't at least win, go to the conference finals, this team needs to be really rejiggered a lot and significant pieces moved out. And What do you do with the Flames will probably do and just fire the coach and try again next year? Oh, that would be... <laughs> infuriating but i think the flames have the ability to win the canadian division which i think is the first two two rounds right you play within your division the first two rounds i'm gonna say the flames go to the third round and then lose i think as soon as they pay, face somebody they haven't seen all year i think adversity is gonna get to them yeah well um in that uh the other division that's kind of in the western conference because i think that's how it aligns I'm not even sure how the playoffs align, if it's just going to be like one through four or not. I, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> you know, it, that, yeah, I'll shelve that whole thought because, you know, we might play. Let's Tampa. wait. Let's wait and see. We don't even, I mean, we don't even know when or where the playoffs will be. So. Yeah, because they might do it like who's the best versus who's the worst of the four conference or like divisions. And yeah, I'm just based on what we've seen from the flames in the past, I'm not convinced this roster is not going to choke and I'm no, not convinced and, this team. And I, I'm right there with you. I think that this team very well could, but the expectation is that they go very deep, if not all the way to the finals, because that is based on the level of talent and depth and all of that crap. That's where they should be. Whether they get there or not, tells you about what this team is and corresponding moves after the fact because like if they lose in the first or second or third round you know like it, it yeah like it, you pretty much would have to start looking at okay monahan out goudreau out giordano out backland out you know and retool from there who do you think will be the player that surprises most in the playoffs? I would even say last year it was Reader. Like, he did way better than we thought. Well, the Flames, well, generally, player the unsung heroes are the fast guys that can, you know, they, they just have more pep in their step and can get more opportunities because of that. So, you know. So which fast guy do you think? I don't really think the Flames have too many fast players, so I'm just going to say Andrew Mangiapane is going to have a hell of a year. <laughs> you think Mangi's just going to like win every trophy this year and take us to the promised land? Honestly, you know, I think he could be one of like the finalists for the Conn Smythe if the Flames won the Cup. The Geo's just going to hand him the Cup when we win it, and he'll be the only guy skating around with it. Eat bread, we'll travel. <laughs> now, I, I wonder, are they going to have to, like, sanitize their hands before each guy takes the cup? No. Uh, One guy takes it, and are they going to be all allowed to drink out of it? Are you going to have to put some sort of liner in it for each guy? I'm not sure. Everybody has a can of spray Purell <laughs> just to spray the cup. Probably, yeah. Some sort of, like, you got to put a plastic liner before you have your drink? I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm going to go with Yusuf Valamaki. I think by the playoffs, we will have one of the top four guys who's out or injured. Yeah. And I think Yusuf will step up and I think we'll impress. Yeah. Last question for you. What do the flames need to do to be successful, to get all the way to the Stanley cup? Well, What's the one key to victory. Well, the flames just need to, I, I find that like in past years, like they have kind of 
gone and played the other team's games far too much, whether that's playing down to loser team's levels or playing the style that corresponds with the other team. And, like, while you do need to do that to a certain extent, uh, the Flames have an identity, you know, and you look at other teams that have been successful and won the Cup, they have a certain way that they do things, and they do it consistently. And the Flames are kind of, and have been kind of wishy-washy. And I think that in order for them to be successful, they need to play a certain way, and be consistent with it game in game out and adapt when need be but you know primarily play that way so consistency yeah i'm gonna say consistency as well but i think more than playing you know another team style i think one of the big things we've seen in the last couple of years they've got to start on time and play 60 minutes a night how often have we oh, seen yeah. them not not come in till the second or play really well and you know let the whole game fall away in the third i think they've got to play i don't care wh whose game they play there's somebody else's you know the the soviets game from from the summit series i don't care whose game they're playing just play somebody's game all damn night yeah <laughs> and play the same game all night yeah you know you can pick pick somebody's game pick from a deck cards i don't care but find a game you want to play and play it from the starting buzzer to the final buzzer mm -hmm. yeah for sure um and and I think that as well as that, they can't go on every year. You and I talk about a six, seven, eight game losing streak. That's going to tank you this year. They've got to stay away from losing streak. Yeah, like frankly, they can't have more than a three or at any point. Yeah, and even so then, me, those are the... you know, like even then, they need to out find ways to stop it at two. Yeah. Yeah. So I think those to me are the, are my definitions of consistency this year. Yeah, I think that this team really needs to find urgency in each game. And, like, I hearken back to, uh, like, the uh, story I read back in the 03, uh, 0203 season for Anaheim. And it was before the Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Finals. And, like, the first game of the season, Mike Babcock said, Okay, well, boys, this is the most important game of the season. And it was Game 1. And he was trying to instill in that team that, like, this game matters as much as any other. And it is the most important game because it's the one that you're playing right now. And this team, I find, far too much looks ahead or, you know, belittles their opponent. Or, you know, like, oh, this team sucks. And then, oh, we lost 4-1. to one. <laughs> And, you know, I think that this team needs to have that urgency, especially with the quickness of this season. And how, you know, each game is just that much more important that, you know, uh, and the, it lends into exactly what you're saying with starting on time, finishing on time. And, yeah. And I think one thing we see with these guys, too, on the consistency side is we see one guy not have a good game and then he tries too hard the next game and he doesn't have another good game. And I think it's not only do you need to, like you said, play this game as though it's the most important, but don't look backwards. Yeah. Well, it, what happened last night happened win lose or draw yeah it's like the whole team plays like sam bennett like if something goes wrong they try too hard take a penalty oh crap <laughs> and rails go off you know and it's just uh yeah like this team needs to find that inner maturity you can have the best roster in the world but if you can't be consistent it doesn't matter mm-hmm well, let's play our other game that you and I like to play every year, and that's our weekly prediction game. We've got two games in the docket this week. We'll be recording next Sunday, the 17th. So before then, we have – this looks like a regular NHL season, one home, one road. We don't really start a, a series yet. Um, but this Thursday, the season opens for the Flames. They're in Winnipeg playing the Jets. Pending – I don't think we know that Manitoba is going to let them play in Winnipeg yet. So pending they do, um, we're in Winnipeg. And that will be a 6 p.m. start time here in Calgary. Then Saturday, we take on the Vancouver Canucks, or you could call them, um, I guess you could say the Calgary Canucks, take on what's left of Vancouver Canucks, because half that those guys are here now. Um, and that'll be an 8 p.m. start time. That's, I guess, our first Hockey Night in Canada game. We even stole so their jersey. <laughs> yeah. The horse had uh, We already had... Well, the horse had... Are the Calgary Canucks still a team, or yeah. do they fold? Oh, I think they're still a team. But, uh, yeah, the... Uh, that horsehead jersey looks awfully like that uh the flying skate jersey so you know 
stole their goalie, stole their defenseman, stole their forward, now stole their jersey. All and good. then Blasty's making fun of them. Yep. Um, what do you think? Two games in the docket, how do the Flames do? Four points. Because both Winnipeg Four and points? Vancouver are kind of they should be on the bottom end and like frankly Vancouver and Winnipeg I would expect to be in like the bottom five to eight of the NHL period so yeah they really need to get off to a good start because those two teams are kind of bad Calgary tends to not do well to be on the season I think that they will uh, lose to Winnipeg I think that they might not be ready to go right out of the gate and Winnipeg, I think that's their home opener, too, might uh, beat them, but I think they'll beat Vancouver. So I'm going to go two points, win against Vancouver, lose to the Jets. Now, the real question is, will I ever get a prediction right this year? <laughs> I think I went 0 for last year. So L- Last year it was uh, 4 nothing. I got 4, you got none. So yeah. you, only have to, you only have to do 56 games this year instead of 82, so maybe yeah. you'll get one. Yeah. Woo. <laughs> Shoot for getting you on know, the maybe, board. Maybe I'll... <laughs> maybe i'll let some of the guys know when i'm doing some media stuff you know matt really need to win this week can you guys just blow this montreal game so matt can win <laughs> yeah he'd really appreciate it or conversely can you actually step up and play t- today because you know matt needs those points in our game you know like <laughs> that's right so hopefully you won't get shut out this year maybe you'll have a markstrom year and you'll uh, you'll do well Markstrom yeah. will save you as well. Yep. Yeah. Uh, All right, Matt. Well, I guess that wraps it up. It's been a long show, but uh, it's we had a lot to talk about going into this season. So I don't think there's anything else to chat about. The last thing I will mention to people is if you're hearing this before Monday the 11th at 7 p.m., there is going to be a live stream of the last of the Flames scrimmages on calgaryflames.com. So we'll post this on our social media as well. But uh, if you want to watch sort of the inner squad game, You'll be able to do that Monday at 7 p.m. Matt, I think that makes us ready for the season. We'll talk to you after two games, and hopefully uh, the sky's not falling already and Calgary's 0 for 2 after the first week of the season. Yeah, that would be fun, especially like if they lose the third one and then they have a five-day break. Like That's just, yeah. A five-day break with nothing to do but sit in their room, so there's a lot of time to dwell on your losses. Yep. Well, it, hopefully the, the Flames get off to a good start this season, and how nice is it going to be, especially during COVID time, to actually have something to do and watch hockey? <laughs> for three hours of the 24 hours. Now you just got to count for the rest. Well... Just as an aside, like in the last three weeks, I've read nine books because I'm literally trying to find anything to do. So, yay, reading. And And there you go. You can read and then watch the game and then read about the game and then watch the game and then read about the game. Exactly. And then you can write a book about being a hockey fan during the COVID year. Yeah, exactly. My tale of boredom. That's right. Well, why don't you get it? Why don't you get us out of here? Well, before you go, start writing your book. Okay. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.